Okay, today is 25th of March, 2025, 8.55 a.m. Pacific time. And just a recap what we have done so far, we covered almost everything in chapter 21, all the way up to magnetic field. Magnetic field produced by a current. The only thing I haven't taught yet, I haven't covered yet, is how we calculate the magnetic field of a given current configuration, okay? And that's what Ampere's law is all about. But before we get into that, I want you to memorize the following. Here are the differences between electric and magnetic field, right? The sources of electric field are electric charges, and the source of magnetic field is an electric current. They are both laws. They are, you know, those two here, they are all both laws of physics. And then there is another important difference between magnetic and electric fields. Electric fields radiate away and towards their source, okay? Whereas magnetic field, they circulate around the source. Uh, let's see. Radiate away and towards the source. Uh, there, and let's put their source. Whereas magnetic fields circulate around their source. Okay, that's what you have to memorize for the differences in magnetic field, and they are all implicit in the in the laws of physics. What I want to do, I want to come up with a little table. Um, Insert. Okay, here go. Source. Okay, and we have something else. Direction. Okay, electric, magnetic. Let's see if this, this table works. Okay, source. We we'll put source here. Direction. Here's going to be electric field, magnetic field, right? The source of electric field is an electric charge. The source of a magnetic field is a electric current. Right? Field direction. Field, let's put field uh, direction. Away and towards source. Okay. Okay, and here with the magnetic field circulates around the source. Can you remember that? I will put it bold faced here. A nice way to display. Oh, I, I need to, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you for reminding me. Oh, so I gotta do that all over again. <laughs> okay, why well, do I keep on forgetting that, right? So now I'm displaying the, the screen here. I want you to see. Okay, 25th of March, 2024. And again, I'm gonna recap what I just said, repeat what I said before, right? I covered almost everything in chapter 21, with the exception of Ampere's law. I told you about the magnetic field and there is some there are some important differences between the electric and the magnetic field. The first thing you have to know about the, the electric and magnetic field is that the source, their sources. Okay, the sources of the electric field is an electric charge, just like I put it here in this table. And the source of a magnetic field are is the electric current. And then I want you also to memorize the field direction. The electric field radiates away and towards the source, whereas 
the magnetic field they circulate around the source. It'll circulate around its source, which means it circulates around the current, right? Let's see if I get right here and let's see here. Let me get, well, I'm gonna show you a, okay, right here. That's a good, and even better, a simpler one, you know, the simpler, simplest configuration of a magnetic field is that of a straight infinitely long wire right in here, okay? If you have the current flowing upwards, the magnetic field circulates around the current according to the right-hand rule. That's what you have to remember, okay? And the same, and, it, and the same uh, idea applies for other configuration, not just a straight wire, but also, for instance, the loop. Let's take a look here at the loop, a current loop. Here you go, here we have a current loop, okay? So do you see here, we have the current flowing in this direction and here is the magnetic field circulating around the, the wire, this piece of wire, and this is spot and this is spot and so on, right? Okay, here you go, here is closed, the whole loop is being closed. Here it should close somewhere there very far away, which is, doesn't show much here in the screen, okay? So I'm gonna write that down here for you. Circulates around the source. Uh, uh, the circulation, field direct does not, uh, um, okay, let's see, field configuration. Let's put field configuration, better. Okay. Field, then we go, we're gonna head and put a, a something else here. Field direction. Okay. Away, positive, positive charges. Away, uh, away, positive charges. Towards, negative charges. Okay, and field direction is given here by the right hand rule. Okay, that's what you have to memorize towards negative charge away, positive charge. Okay. And what else did I tell you? I am going to hunt down the equations that I wrote, I wrote before. Okay, the first one you gotta know is this one right in here. Well, uh, you know what? Let, let me copy and paste everything there. I'm gonna need that. Here you go. Okay, right in here. Like that, okay? The first thing that you have to know is that the magnetic field is always proportional to its source. Just like the electric field is proportional to its source, the magnetic field also is proportional to its source, right? And let's put another one here. Here you go, the electric field proportional to the charge. Proportional to the charge. The magnetic field is also proportional to the charge, okay? The B field, we have, uh, remember we have the case of uh, the electric field, E field of an infinitely long charge distribution. Right? And if you remember the electric field of infinitely long charge distribution, we calculated 
that which was proportional to the Q, but is also inversely proportional to the distance. We did that, right? Yeah, we did that using Gauss's law. Similarly, uh, for an infinitely long straight wire, look, we have something similar. The magnetic field is proportional to the current, inversely proportional to the distance. Okay? Actually, the exact field distribution is this one that you see right in here. Mu naught i over 2 pi r. Okay? So there is some similarities, right? Decreases with the inverse of the distance in both cases. But don't forget, I'm going to emphasize here that infinitely long, infinitely long. So they follow parallel to each other, right? Ego, what else? And then we do have the parallel plate capacitor produces a uniform, uh, uniform electric field, remember that? And I'm going to write that down here. A uniform electric field that's proportional to the charge only. To be more specific, right? To be more specific, do you remember that? What is the exact solution? Is going to be, you know, Q divided by A, which is the area of the parallel plate divided by what else? Epsilon naught. Epsilon naught. Or, you know, can be here written down as four. Four pi k. That's the relationship between epsilon naught and, and uh, k. Here you go. What you see right in here, we usually denote by the surface charge density that we call sigma. Okay. And the magnetic field is similar. We have a uh, we have something, uh, we have a configuration that's similar to that of the parallel plate capacitor. Parallel plate capacitor produces a uniform electric field. But then it is the solenoid that produces a uniform magnetic field inside the solenoid, okay? So we have mu naught, the current, and the number of turns per unit of length, okay? And how do we calculate that? Uh, and there is one more. Uh, there's one more. Uh, a loop of current, a loop, B field of a loop of, of current loop, B field of a current loop at the center, B field at the center of a current loop. Okay, and it's also given in the book. Something like that. This N here. What's N? N here. N turns. If you have just one turn here, like you have in this illustration, this N is going to be equal to 1. If you have two turns, right? N is equal to 2. Three turns, N equal to 3. The more the turns, the larger the field, okay? So I'm going to write that down, this equation. We also have the counterpart for the, for the electric field, right? But I'm not gonna write that down here. N mu naught I, uh, we feel the center of a current loop with N turns. Uh, be filled at the center of a current loop of radius r and n turns. What that's going to be, don't forget, is always proportional to i. Right? It's always proportional to i. I'm going to put... Uh, 
that's going to be divided by two, all right, you go. And then we have the number of terms right in here. All these results, all these results, are obtained using Ampere's law. Using Ampere's law. And Ampere's law is the following. Okay? Right in here. That's what Ampere's law. It's kind of similar to, to Coulomb's law, to Gauss's law. Gauss's law for the electricity. The only difference is that for Gauss's law, we have an area here. Here, instead of an area, we have a, a pass. Oh, people trying to come in. Let's see. OK, and we'll see that Gauss's law, we have enclosed charge in close to current, right? B parallel stands for the B parallel to the current loop. And, and I'm going to walk you through how you calculate that stuff, OK? Magnet for slow and so on. Let's see how, let us see how we can calculate the magnetic field, magnetic field of a infinitely long wire using Gauss's, uh, using Ampere's law, Ampere's law, okay? So here you go, Gauss's law of, uh, oh, Gauss's law for electricity, Gauss's law from, for magnetism, magnetic force law, or Lorentz force, we call it also the Lorentz force law, Ampere's law, and Ampere's law so far. Polina just come in. Okay. Infinitely long wire using Ampere's law. First step. First step. No. Uh, recognize that an element of current, an element of current is the source for the magnetic field. The further, the further away the source is, the weaker the magnetic field will be. Same point up. Makes sense, right? It's just like the source of a sound. If you have a, a, a speaker producing sound, the further away you are from this speaker, the weaker the sound is, right? The same thing happens to magnetic fields, to magnetic and electric fields. As you move away from the source, the electric field and the magnetic field becomes weaker. Okay. Then what else? Recall that these fields always circulate around its sources, okay? According to the right-hand rule. Recall that. Okay, and also, you must recognize as well, recognize 
as well that of this law applies only to problems that have symmetry, okay? Gotta realize that as well, recognize that as well. Ampere's law applies only to problems that have symmetry. Uh, recall the B field always circulate around the sources. Okay. Oh, one more thing. Because it circulates around the source, you must use a, an imaginary path instead an imaginary imaginary closed path instead of imaginary closed surface to determine its field, okay? And recall, recognize as well that the people apply only to problems that have symmetry, just like uh, Gauss's law, Gauss's law for electricity. Okay. So we're starting with the infinitely long wire, the infinitely long wire has cylindrical symmetry. with an imaginary cylinder, imaginary cylinder centered at the position of the wire, right? Uh, with an imaginary cylinder centered at the since, don't forget, we're not going to use a cylinder in this case, right? We are going to use a closed path instead. Since, you know, Ampere's law uses a closed path, then we must use a circular pass around the wire to calculate a circular wire of radius R circular pass around the wire circular pass around the wire. This is a circular pass of radius R around the wire to calculate the B field, okay? So let's go get it here, let's see. Uh, I want one here for you. Okay, here you go. Here's my wire, right? It's a really long wire. That's one way of doing, of Calculating the magnetic field, we are not going to use this way. But I want to be, I want you to be, be reminded that the magnetic field circulates around this wire. So at this point here in the x y plane, the magnetic field is pointing towards you, whereas on the other side, the magnetic field points away from you. Okay. Similarly. Okay. Right hand rule. What I want to do. Okay. I want you to look now at this wire, not in the XY plane, not facing the XY plane, but facing the YZ plane, okay? So here we go. I'm going to eliminate the magnetic field here. Okay, going back here, here we go. Right hand rule, magnetic field, on the upper half of the XY plane, magnetic field is pointing towards you. Magnetic field is pointing away from you on the lower half. 
the magnetic field is circulating around this wire according to the right hand rule, right? And now we're going to look at this wire from this position. Okay, looking straight at the X axis. When you look straight at the X axis, the Z axis is gonna to point to the left, the Y axis is gonna to point to upwards. And the X axis now coincides with my current wire. What you have here is I for current, X for X axis, okay? At, since this problem has cylindrical symmetry, we can pick up a point at distance R of the wire that is in which we are going to have a B field and this B field is going to circulate around this wire. Okay, at this point, the B field has this direction, as this other point, the B field has this other direction, and so on. And here is what we call my Ampedian loop. We choose an appropriate Ampedian loop, okay? Which, according to the symmetry of the problem, is going to be a circle. And this circle is going to help us calculate the magnetic field. An Ampedian loop that's a closed Ampedian loop, right? Because since the period loop is a closed path, then we must use a, an, a circular path of radius r around the, the wire. This path, this path we also call a non-median loop. Median loop. Yeah, okay. And now, now we apply the formula. We apply Ampere's law. So we have to do all that stuff before getting to the calculations, right? Here you go. Okay. We have something like that. We have just a six. Here, here is a summation, okay? Summation of different paths, okay? In our case, in the case of... Uh, in the case of an infinitely, infinitely long wire, comma, we have a single circular path what does it mean? It means that n is equal with n equal to one, with n equal to one. Okay? That's what we end up having. What else? So, my formula can be reduced to something like that. You know, B parallel times delta L. B parallel to delta to the path. And by the way, B parallel means parallel to the path, okay? That's what it means. Just a single loop, just a single pass. The, okay, in the case of infinitely long wire, we have a single circular path with n equal to one. A bold formula reduces to, okay, from item two, from item two. Comma, we found that B is tangent to the pass. Okay, tangent to the pass, according to the right hand rule, right? Right hand rule, right hand rule. And 
and it shouldn't be bold faced. I don't want it bold faced. Yeah. Consequently, the component of be parallel to the the loop, Ampedian loop, is going to be B itself. Okay, and then we have another important step here, mathematical step. Oh. B, we can remove the parallel symbol. Okay. Now, let's not forget, one more, one more step. The current enclosed, the current enclosed by the Ampedian loop is I, okay? So now we can simplify that further. What is in red here is gonna become uh, I enclosed, become just I. Yeah, put it. Okay. And now we go ahead and calculate, you know, calculate, cal write down, not calculate, but write down the length of delta L, which is, by the way, which, by the way, is going to be 2 pi R, right? The length of the circumference. We are almost over. Two pi r, two pi r. Low battery. Running out of battery here in my mouth apparently. I remember that we. Oh, okay. I run out of battery. Let me get my other battery here. And now we solve for the magnetic field. Ah, this one is also low. And another one here. This one's gonna work. Those are the step by step two pi r two pi r. Okay, that's the step by step. And you can do the same for other configurations. You can do the same for other configurations, okay? In the case, let, let's do that. In the case for the For the solenoid, let's do the solenoid. The solenoid is a little bit lengthy, but it's worth doing it. In the case of the solenoid, so here you go. That's how the magnetic field behaves around my completely long wire, right? It circulates around it. Further away, it's going to be a lower, a shorter, a less intense magnetic field. OK. And uh, if you, now suppose that we have two wires, one parallel to each other, you already know that at the position of this wire right in here, there will be a magnetic field due to one, right? Pointing into the board. If we apply the magnetic force law for this case, just cross I with B, 
you find out that the force that one exerts in two is going to be a force, an attractive force, right? And similarly, if we account for the magnetic field of the wire number two, we are going to have a magnetic field that comes out from the board. Okay, you apply I cross B to that, and then you have a, an attractive force to a force of two in one. It's gonna be to the right. So two wires parallel to each other, flowing current in the same direction, will have an attractive force between them, okay? And if the currents flow contrary to them, then the force is gonna be repulsive. Okay. So, and you can do the same thing. Now that you know that the magnetic field of a single wire circulates around this one here, you can find out the net field of two wires, right? So let's do that too. What about net field of two wires? Uh, I'm gonna move this one to the right, like that. Okay, I will call this one, let, let's start with current I, right? They call it the current I here. And let's say that you now we also have a second wire next to this other one right here. And I'll call it this one here, the Y prime axis. Yeah, here is going to be the Z prime axis. Z prime axis, right? In both cases, the, the magnetic field circulates around it. But what's going to be the net magnetic field? The net magnetic field is gonna be just the superposition of those two fields. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do even better, here you go. Let's say, I wanna know exact, suppose that this outer circle of both magnetic fields coincide with each other, right? Oh. Right? Look what's happening here. Same, uh, same current on both, flowing parallel to each other. At the net field at this spot here, right? At this spot right here is gonna be zero. Right? I'm gonna put it, a green dot right in here to denote zero magnetic field, right? Like that, okay? At this point here, very far away, right? Uh, you're going to have a superposition of a weaker magnetic field, okay? You wanna, here you go. Maybe I should change colors, let's change colors. Let's change colors so you can see more easily. I'll put uh, red color now. Uh, 
Maar doe dat al over again. This one as well. Anything else? And now we change the color to red. Okay, and I'm going to change the color to red here to red. Uh, I'll leave it like that. I'll leave it like that. Very far away to the right, you know. This view, the field of this one is going to contribute to a B field, somewhat like that. Okay. Similarly, at this spot, the contribution of the B field on the left is going to be a little bit larger. So it's going to superimpose with this one. And then you can do the right hand rule here as well. Okay, the right hand rule is going to point a magnetic field, kind of an angle, right here. All right? At this point here is going to be a magnetic field that's going to be upwards, a little bit stronger than the others. It's not going to be completely canceling down because this distance here is closer than this distance here, right? I got just a little bit more, let's see, let's adjust a little bit more, weaker, a little bit weaker, a little bit weaker. Here you go. At this point, the magnetic field is going to point in this other direction here, right hand rule. Right? Right hand rule a little bit turn this way. See that? And the same thing happened to this to this other one. Here we know that's zero. The distance is the same, right? And now uh, at this point, right? The B field is going to be considerably weaker. And I'm going to start to erase those indications here. So the, so the drawing is not that busy. Oh. Doesn't become that busy. Okay. This other one further away is going to be weaker, even weaker, right? Can I do one more? Yeah, I can do another one here. I see it has to be perpendicular. This one should be a little bit angle, a little bit angle more like that. Okay. And then we have the same thing for the other ones here. Let's see. You go circulating. It's going to be like that. I will copy that like that. I'll put the green color here. And I'll change the direction of my arrow as well. Like that, right? This other one at the bottom is going to be a little bit angled here. 
plus the same distance. This length has to be the same as this length. Okay. This one is going to be like that, a little bit like that, just slightly shorter. And the other one has to be the same length, but it has to be a different direction. Okay, no. No, it's not a different direction. It's gonna be like that, right? Did I do everything right? Yeah. Hopefully it is. Nothing wrong. Let next step. Okay. So just by getting the magnetic field of this one alone, you can figure out what would gonna be the net magnetic field of of other configurations. For instance, when we add a second wire, right? And now here you go. The net field is gonna be longer the net field is going to be somewhat like that. I can erase that now, right? The net field is gonna be somewhat like that. That's, that's a qualitative treatment, don't forget. But you can also do a... Algebraic treatment as well. It's no longer going to be tangent, right? Because we have the influence of this other wire here. The magnetic field, I'm going to put everything red, the net magnetic field. You can do the summation, right? Vector summation, the vectorial summation. This red is going to cancel out. This red is going to help it, making it longer, making it longer. Uh, okay. And then we got to change the color of this green arrow to red. We sum those two vectors and we get something like that. This one, we. Okay, this one is gonna be blah blah blah. I didn't do this one, right? Okay, it's gonna be somewhat like that. Red. It's not gonna be parallel to this one. This one's gonna be red as well. Did you get the idea? That's the law of superposition. And now what I can do here. I can put it a, a red because everything else is red, right? Zero here. A little bit more complicated, okay? And here is the force of attraction and repulsion between those two. Right? So Ampere's law. I'm going to show you Ampere's law, how it applies in the most uh, genetic way. Okay. Before we go into that, let me write, what time is that? 9.45. Okay, we can go a little bit longer. Indicated for a solenoid. We're going to do the solenoid very soon. Okay. From the above, we can now find qualitatively, qualitatively, the net B field of two infinitely long wires separated by a given distance using the Superposition rule, superposition rule, okay? See recording, right? See recording. We can also find, therefore, 
the force, the magnetic force that one exerts in the other. Okay. Apply Ampere's um, law in the in the most generic sense, okay? And that's gonna be a an example, okay? The, an example is gonna be this one right here. Suppose that we have current one, two, and three flowing here. I don't want to find the magnetic field. Finding the magnetic field will be lots of work, okay? But there's a simpler problem that we can do right here. Hey, go. I1 is towards you, I2 is towards you, I3 is into the board. And then suppose that I choose this uh, arbitrary ampedian loop that I call loop number one, okay? What's going to be the net current passing through this loop, this loop right in here? Okay, this loop does not enclose any current whatsoever. Consequently, the enclosed current is going to be equal to zero. Okay. So that's what we have for this one. C illustration in the recording. Okay. Example one. Now suppose that I choose a different loop. Here you go. Suppose I choose this loop number two, and is and the and this loop is flowing the counterclockwise direction. Okay, and not only is flowing the the counterclockwise direction, it also enclosing all the three currents, I1, I2, and I3, okay? The enclosed current in this case, what's gonna be? It's gonna be I1 plus I2 because they have a positive sign because they point in the counterclockwise direction using the right-hand rule. And the I3 is negative because it's oriented in the clockwise direction instead. That's why we have this negative sign, okay? So that's what's the next one here that we have. Loop number two is a very good way of indicate of loop number two. It includes all three currents consequently. The enclosed current is going to be something like that. Loop three, and then we have loop three and four as well. I guess you, that's easy, right? You can get the idea here. here. Loop three and four. Okay, so we go. Now loop number three is uh, clockwise, right? Because it's clockwise, now it's going to be I1 and I2. That's going to have a, a negative sign. And I3 is going to have a positive sign. I enclose is going to be like that. Finally, we have this loop number four that's enclosing only two currents. And it's going the clockwise direction. It's going to be minus I1 minus I2. Okay? Minus I1 minus I2. So in order to find the I enclosed, here you go. In order to find I enclosed, you must choose an appropriate loop, choose a direction for this loop, counterclockwise or clockwise. Calculate the net current according to the right hand rule. Okay. So 950. Let's go a little bit. Let's see this one other one. Okay. Let's see this 
Yeah, let's do a, another one, another example. It's a little bit more difficult. We go. Oh, by the way, Ampedian loop coincides with the integral pass, right? With the pass. Circular loop off center of the current carrying wire. You cannot solve a problem like that. Coincide and we go. Magnetic fields. Okay, this one. I want to do this one as well. A solid wire in which the current is uniformly distributed throughout the cross section of the wire, okay? Radius R. What I want to know, you know, uh, it's not infinitely long wire, it's infinitely long rod. Infinitely long rod. This one here. Before we do the solenoid, let's do this one that's simpler than the solenoid example. Infinitely long rod of radius R carry an uniformly distributed current. A current uh, carrying a current uh, carry a current a net current a net current I that is uniformly distributed throughout its cross section throughout its cross section of radius big R. Okay, find the B field. Uh, for R less than big R. So here you go. Here is my, my cross section here. Okay, so we have uh, currents all over this place here, current. Uh, we have currents all over this cross section here. Current here. And it's uniformly distributed. Do, do you picture that? It's possible to have something like that in real life. Okay, another one here. Okay, it's possible to have something like that in real life. I'm not gonna do everyone. But it's uniformly distributed in this cross section. Outside this wire is just like the it's just like the solution that you saw before, mu naught i divided by 2 pi r. The trick here is to find out what would be the current inside this cross section of the wire. That would be the trick. So here you go. We go ahead and choose my Ampedian loop in this way because the problem has cylindrical symmetry. Here you go, my Ampedian loop. See that? I'm going to point the direction of motion of my path in the counterclockwise direction. So it, it coincides with the direction of the B field. Okay. And we go ahead, we use, we use Ampere's law. Okay. So here you go. First step. I already told you that outside the, you know, for uh, for radius greater than the radius of the wire, the field is the one that you calculated previously. Okay. The challenge now is to find out what would be the B field for a distance r less than the radius of the rod. Okay. In order to do that, we must define a current density that's given in terms of the cross section of the cross sectional area of the wire that's going to be given like that, right? It happens that this, since the current is uniformly distributed through the wire, <clears throat> we are going to have that this current density is going to be the net current divided by the net area. Okay. 
and the net area is going to be given by the area of this circle of the wire for pi r. No, no, it's not for pi, sorry. It's pi r squared. Do you see that? That's what j is all about. It's a very useful definition here in this j. Makes our calculations easier. Because now that we have this J, we can calculate how much current we have enclosed here in the circle, okay? In the circle of radius R, okay? And how is it done? Okay, so here we go. My, since J is defined like that, right? I'm gonna repeat it for A, radius little r, the net current will be given by, you go, something like that. Don't forget that j now is i divided by pi r squared, right? i, the current delta i, In this case, the area delta A prime is going to be given by pi r squared, lowercase r. And now we can find this current delta i just by solving. Just by solving accordingly, right? The pi cancel out with the pi. And we have this delta i, which is also the, delta, the i enclosed by the amperium loop. I'm gonna write that down here, here you go. Enclosed by the amperium loop, something like that. And now, and now we can go ahead and solve for the magnetic field at that region. B2 pi r, right? Equal to mu naught enclosed. And look what we get. We solve for B alone. This pi, let's see, this r cancel out with this r. And the magnetic field is going to increase uh, inside the cross section of the rod, right? Of the rod, the B field increases with the distance R. Until it reaches a maximum value at r equal to big R, right? Given by given by something like that. And then and then decreases as okay, I'm gonna put the out. Here okay, I'm gonna put in. Okay, I'm gonna define inside, and here I'm gonna put at the edge, right? At the edge, mu not i. That's the case of the rod flowing a uniform current through this cross-section. Ten o'clock. Let's see. 
We're going to do, now we can do the solenoid. The solenoid is a problem a little bit more complicated. Think about that. I'm going to just to introduce you, you know, the next problem, the next example is that of a solenoid, is that of a solenoid. Very important, okay? The solenoid is very important. It is the one, it is the one that has a uniform B field inside it. The solenoid is the magnetic counterpart of the parallel plate capacitor of the electric parallel plate capacitor because both of them, both of these devices have a uniform field. Okay. So the way we do it, you know, just visualize your solenoid right in here. This is a very important device. We find it everywhere. And, and by the way, what you see right in here is also what we call an inductor. Okay. This the solenoid is also considered an inductor. Remember that I told you there are four basic elements in electricity and electronics, the capacitor, the resistor, the inductor, and then the transistor. The transistor we are not gonna, we are not gonna study, okay? Every component behaves like the, all those four devices. So the inductor is, some, is just like a, a solenoid. So current flows through this wire. There's a bunch of turns right in here. And how do we solve this problem, right? I'm gonna you just give you a qualitative view how we solve this problem. Uh, initially, you know, initially we solved from qualitative. Let's write it down here. Initially, we solved this problem qualitatively. And then apply uh, Ampere's law. Okay. But we are going to take a break right now. I gave you enough information to start thinking about that. And then we're going to use the next two minutes to take, uh, to take attendance. Jacqueline, are you there? OK, Jacqueline. OK, she's here. Sky. Here. Thank you. Ashley. Hello, Ashley. Ashley was the first one to arrive here. I'm going to give her attendance since she was the first one to arrive here. Okay, next, Corina. Hello, Corina. Okay, I'm going to put the I star in Corina's name, Norberto Lopez. I ah, no, Corina is here. Thank you, Corina. I don't see Norberto. No, Vanessa Mena. Here. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you. I I was I start correcting the lab two report and then I came across a a bug in my computer program and I couldn't correct it. Okay, I'll try to figure out to figure out how to fix that bug in my computer problem in my computer program that I used to correct the lab reports. Now, let's see, next one is going to be Yorgo. Here. Thank you, Yorgo. Lizelle. And next one is Paul Zapata. Okay, we have eight students. Yeah. And it's 10.05 right now. Break. 10.05 a.m. to 10. 20 a.m. I see you in 20 minutes. Stop sharing. Okay, I'm back here.
Now let's talk about the solenoid. Okay, so here you go. So you have this tube in which you wire, you turn a bunch of uh, copper wires in there and connect to a battery. Okay. So once you connect to a battery, a current is gonna flow through those wires that you see right in here. In order to solve this problem of the solenoid, we have to make a hydro, we have to withdraw this solenoid in a different way. We're gonna redraw it in this way. Right? So here you go, we have the current flowing towards you at the top of the solenoid. It goes around the surface and then go into the board. Okay? Turn and go, keep on flowing like in turns like that. Okay, and then the next thing we do is to look at each of these wires one by one, okay? So that's what we have right now. Wires one by one. And let me... I'm gonna document all this step by step here that you need to know. Okay, so we go. Solenoid, example, find the B field of a solenoid of radius R and length L. We are assuming that the solenoid is much, is very long compared to the radius. L is much greater than R. Everything that we're doing here is a, is a, is an approximation, okay? But it's an approximation that works pretty well in the real life, even though it's an approximation. All those results are very close to what we find in real life. It has, the solenoid has in turns. The wires have a current of I. The wires uniformly around the tube. We want to find out the B field everywhere in the solenoid for radius less than radius of the solenoid, for radius greater than the radius of the solenoid, okay? The important thing here that you have to know is that this problem, the solution of this problem is a mixture of qualitative and quantitative results. The qualitative, the qualitative result required an extensive analysis of the geometry of the problem to understand all the details that go into the details that go in the behavior of the B field, okay? So the first step we already did, we draw, um, first step we already did, here you go. We draw a wire around the tube. Or, or around the rod too, it can be a rod as well. We draw the current passing through the wire. We indicate the directions of the current on the top and bottom portions of the solenoid. Then you analyze a single wire, a single, not a single wire, but a single turn, right? Then you analyze a single turn at the top of the solenoid and draw the magnetic field around it, just like uh, just like you do you do for the infinitely long wire infinitely long wire, and I did that here for you. Here you go. Here is the 
this top wire right here, right, is producing a magnetic field around it. And then I drew the magnetic field around it. In the next step, you are going to draw a second wire next to the first one. And you analyze what happens to the magnetic field as well. OK, the magnetic field circulates around the second wire, just like it circulates around the first wire, right? And then you start to realize that there cannot be any magnetic field in the vertical direction in between those two wires. In between, not, not those two wires, but those two turns. Those two turns. Do you see here? Right? So now we can redraw the magnetic field line. It's going to be something that's going to go around the, these two wires. This is a qualitative result, which works pretty well, by the way. By the way, OK? Here you go. Next here. Place a second wire next to the first one and draw the magnetic field as well. Right? Notice that the vertical component of B field cancels out in between these two wires. Repeat. Repeat for N wires. Repeat the above for N wires. And notice that the B field is. The B field has only a horizontal component, has only a horizontal, has mostly, right? Mostly a horizontal component. And that's what we get right in the next one, right? Here. We do for N wires. The only difference is going to be at the edge, right? There will be a little of uh, vertical component in there. But you're going to see that this vertical component at the edge is going to be negligible. So we did for the top wires, for the top loops, for the current at the top uh, of the loops at the top. But at the bottom is going to be different, right? Here you go. Here's the bottom. It's going to, the field is going to circulate in the clockwise direction, counterclockwise direction at the top, clockwise direction at the bottom. And then we do the same thing that we did before. Next wire, notice that we, it still cancels out the vertical components. Next loop, next loop, not next wire, right? It's just a single wire. Next loop, another loop, OK? And then we are displaying here only the field the field let me do something here. I wanna yeah. The field are only at the very middle of the solenoid. Overall, we are getting this result here. Magnetic field circulates counterclockwise at the top, clockwise at the bottom. OK, so we go. Repeat the above. Repeat steps four through seven for the wires at the bottom of the solenoid, right? B field, B field circulates counter clock 
wise at the top and clockwise at the bottom. Okay. Either way, even though it's, it's circulating clockwise at the bottom, notice that this field here has exactly the same direction of this field here, right? Isn't that nice? And on the outside, sure. You know, in the inside, the field is from the left to the right, right? From the left to the right at the top and left to the right at the bottom. On the outside, is from the right to the left at the bottom, right to the left at the top as well. Okay, what's next? Okay, well, well, we recognize that because the radius of the solid noid is much smaller compared to its length, okay, it is fair, it is reasonable to assume that the contribution of the E field of this bottom part of the solenoid is going to be almost the same. And that's because of the dimensions, okay? Extend, here you go. The, the next step here, extend the B field. Extend the B field of the bottom wire upwards. Okay. Because L is much larger than big R, it's reasonable to assume that the B field extending upwards has a very small change. Okay. Oh, and there's more too. I'm extending upwards. And don't forget, I'm standing past the top portion of the wire as well. And look what's happening. When we extend it upwards, we get a magnetic field that counters this other magnetic field. Okay? So outside, inside the solenoid, so inside the solenoid, comma, the contribution of the bottom loops adds to the contribution of the top loops. Conversely, conversely, outside the solenoid, outside the solenoid, the contribution of the top bottom loops, you know, subtracts, right? Cancels the contribution of the top loops. The conclusion, is that inside the solenoid, the field is much stronger than outside. We can even say that, that outside, the field is negligible, okay? Negligible. Going back here, here you go, here you go. Field is zero at the top. And now we repeat the same for the field at the top. We extend the field at the top and we get the same type of behavior, okay? So repeat steps, not 9 through 11. Let's see. It's, uh, let's see, repeat step.
steps 10 through 13 for the sapphires and we find a similar solution, a similar situation, but a similar solution, right? So, we go, the fields here outside, the solenoid cancels out, with the field contribution of the of the bottom part. The field contribution of the top part cancels out the field contribution of the bottom part. Okay, so here we go. So that's what we conclude. Not just the field is negligible at the top, but the field is also negligible at the bottom, outside. All right. Past the bottom. So the conclusion that uh, inside the solenoid this field is much stronger than outside at the top, right? We conclude. We also conclude that the field inside the solenoid is much greater than the B field outside the solenoid, right? In order, in other words, one, two, three, B out. B in, B out. Like that. In other words, B out is approximately zero. B out is negligible. Negligible or close to zero. We're not done yet. Okay, and I'm gonna repeat here because L is much greater than R. In the next, now that's, you know, we finished, we, we completed the qualitative, qualitative portion of the analysis. Now we will use a rectangular, Ampedian loop at the top and bottom of the solenoid. Okay. Right. Notice that the Ampedian loop, Ampedian loop has four sides. Or path. Two in the horizontal. Of length L. And two in the vertical. Okay. Apply Ampere's law. All these four arms. Okay, and we will be using, but the first step, I'm gonna show you now the, the Empyrean loop. Empyrean loop, you go, right field here is very strong, B out is approximately zero, and now we have the Empyrean loop. I'm choosing the direction of motion of the path of the Empyrean loop coinciding with the direction of the current. I'm calling this length here L. I don't need to call this length anything. Pass one, pass two, three, and four. Right? I put it A here. Let's put L. Okay. 
So no T along the path one. The path direction coincides with the direction of the magnetic field. Along the path two and four, the field is perpendicular to the direction of motion of the path. Consequently, this, this product here is going to be zero, right? There is no vertical component of the magnetic field. Along the path three, the magnetic field is zero. And we have the same situation here for the path number four, okay? The same situation that we found for the path number two. So going back to the mass, here you go. Magnetic field parallel to the direction of the path of the arm. Right? Along path one, along path two, three, and four. And uh, that must be equal to the constant times the enclosed current, the current that's enclosed. But the current that's enclosed is going to be the number, here you go, the number, I don't know, n prime, I wanna put n prime here. There's a reason. Okay, the number of turns, times the current. Okay, we have to extend this loop to the whole length of the of the solenoid. That's what we're doing. And then we start doing our simplifications. Okay, inside the, the solenoid. Inside the solenoid, we are going to have a magnetic field B1 times the pass length. Okay, I call it L. Along the path number two, there is no component of magnetic field that's parallel to the direction of motion along the path. Consequently, this one is gonna be zero, right? Delta L2 is not zero because there is no magnetic field component in the vertical direction. Along path number three, we found that the magnetic field is negligible. Consequently, it's going to be zero. And along the path number four, we do not have any parallel components either. Okay, so you got to put zero here. So the situation is like that, you know? This one is going to be B1, right? This one is going to be B1. You know, this one is going to be zero parallel to the direction of motion of the path, right? That's what it means parallel here. See that the direction of motion of path, there is no component of the magnetic field along this direction of motion here of the path. We also have uh, this thing applies to be two and before, but in the case of B3, is a little is a little different than the other one. In the case of B three, it is the magnetic field along uh, in the outside the loop that's going to be zero, which implies that the parallel component is also going to be zero. Okay, going to be like that. And finally, we are almost ready to solve our problem. You see, do you see how lengthy it is? It's, le it's lengthier in the qualitative portion, right? Here it's gonna be all zeros. We don't need this guy here. Yeah, this part we do not need either, right? We are almost done. 
magnetic field inside the solenoid is going to be given by, remember, is directly proportional to the current. And I'm going to take out this mu naught i and put outside the ratio. And this ratio here, I call it the number of turns per unit length. Note, see that this is a constant. This is also a constant. And this is a constant. There is no... There is no dependence. They're both field. They're both field. Has no dependency on the coordinates x, y, and z, right? X, y, and z. Consequently, the field is uniform. Okay. So the situation is the following. The final, right? Uniform field for R less than big R, zero for R greater than big R. Okay. So compare that to the parallel plate capacitor. E is equal to sigma over epsilon, epsilon not inside capacitor, inside the capacitor, capacitor, the volume of the capacitor, right? The volume of the capacitor equal to zero outside. Outside the volume of the capacitor. Compare that the solenoid with the capacitor. So if you if you learn well the capacitor, you will understand that well as well. 10.50. I think it's a good point to to break to start our break again. And we are done, we are done with chapter 21. We are done with chapter 21, okay? Let's have our break now. Break from 10, 51 a.m. to 11.06 a.m., right? Yeah. Any questions before we, we go for our break? Okay, so I uh, will see you in 15 minutes. Okay, now we are starting chapter 22. That's a very important chapter. Let's let us uh, formulate the laws of physics so far. Let's repeat, right? Reformulate now, repeat here. The laws of physics we covered so far.
The first one is this one here. That's another one. Okay, here you go. One, two, three, four. Okay. Okay, that's Gauss causes love for electricity. Gauss's law for electricity. Go. Gauss's law for magnetism. Magnetic force law or Lorentz force. <coughs> or Lorentz force law. Okay, and Pierce Law. Oh boy. Shine the screen, right? I like to put this one, I want to separate those this one here from the others. Okay. Let's separate this one from the others. Uh, Ah, and I'm going to take this one out, simplify, right? I go. Okay, one, two, three, plus this one here. This. <laughs> And then we have uh, chapter 22 is the law of electro electromagnetic induction. Ah. So we have one more law coming, okay? We have one more law. It's going to be the law of electromagnetic in induction. And let's see what it's all about. What does it mean by electromagnetic induction, right? What does it mean by electromagnetic induction? Well, electromagnetic induction means, in this specific case here, is that we can induce or create an electric field by means other than using a battery or an electric charge distribution, OK? Some time ago, initially, how the story goes of physics, right? The story of physics goes like that. The story of the electric field. Electric field goes like that. The story of electric field in physics goes like that. OK? And first, we discovered that the electric field is produced by an electric charge distribution. Okay, that's what we discovered first. Then we realized that the that we can produce, we can produce an electric field using something else, using something else. 
okay? In other words, in other words, the electric field can be produced. And I'm gonna give you the, the spoiler right now. Can be produced using, hey, a magnetic field. Have you ever thought about that? It is the magnetic field that induces the electric field. Okay. And how do we find that out? Okay, the easiest way to understand it, although it is not the whole story, right? Is that we can induce an electric current in a circuit without a battery, okay? We call that a battery. We call that a battery. It's nothing but An electric charge is that is nothing but a device, right? It's nothing but a device that has an electric charge distribution between its polarities. Okay, that's what the battery is all about. Electric charge is on one end of the battery. Positive electric charge on one end of the battery, negative electric charge on the other end of the battery. And the battery is kept off, is, uh, is capable of maintaining this electric charge distribution for quite a long time, okay? That's why we say that when you run out of juice in a battery, like in my rechargeable battery, or, or your battery there in your car, we say that uh, we need to recharge the battery. That's exactly what we are doing. You know, the charges got depleted from the ends of the battery in the case of a rechargeable battery. Like this one I'm holding, right? I have a positive charge here at the top, negative charge here at the, at the bottom. When the battery is discharged, what, what, what does it mean? It, it means that we no longer have positives here at the top and negatives here at the bottom. Then we have to recharge the battery again. The regular battery is the one that I am using right now in my mouse, right? Remember that is my battery got discharged. This one here is not is not capable of being recharged, unfortunately. Okay, so this one cannot be recharged. So it's not every battery that can be recharged. The battery in your car can be recharged several times up to a certain lifetime, five years, six years, right? And that, uh, and that's what the law of, ele of electromagnetic induction is all about. You can generate, it's possible to generate an electric field with a magnetic field. And let's see how people found that out. Okay, how can we do that? Okay, there are different ways of doing that. And I can show you some experiments demonstration experiments. Well, we can get a magnetic bar and we, you can approach and receive the magnetic bar to a closed loop circuit. No need of a battery, just motion, okay? The important thing here is that because I'm moving my magnetic bar, the magnetic field that the circular loop feels changes with time, okay? So the key here is a changing, a variation of the magnetic field, a temporal variation of the magnetic field. One way. And I can illustrate that for you. I'm gonna go here for My illustrations. 
and let's magnetic induction right in here. Okay, so here you go. We have a loop with no battery whatsoever. Current loop with no battery whatsoever. And then I go ahead and here you go. Here's uh, what you have here is the area vector of my loop. Okay, the area vector of my loop is perpendicular to the plane of the circuit. And what do I do? I subject this loop to a magnetic field. The magnetic field can be into the board or outside the board, either way. Okay. If, this mag if you manage to create a magnetic field that changes with time, okay, then we manage to induce a current in this circuit. And it has, this type of induction has very important practical applications. That's one way of doing that. To change the magnetic field in time is just, all you gotta do is to get a magnetic bar, right? Let's say I'm holding here a magnetic bar, right? When I approach my magnetic bar to this circuit, this is the magnetic bar, this is my circuit, this circuit, feels a changing magnetic field, a magnetic field that changes in time, right? Remember, the magnetic field here is going to be, have different magnitudes depending on the distance. That's one way of inducing, of creating a magnetic field that changes in time. Okay. And let's go for you to YouTube. Let's go to YouTube. You're you are going to see a there are a bunch of uh, demonstrations. Uh, let's see here. Electromagnetic induction. Electromagnetic induction. Demonstration, experiment, okay. Let's see, go. Okay, and uh, I want the one is, I want the one is the magnetic bar. Oh yeah, I have the, I have one of the magnetic bar here, but uh, here you go. Well, da mulher, ela vai atrás. Ele não precisa vir atrás da mulher mais. A gente vai falar o que go. Ok, so we are using here a closed loop circuit. And what you see right here is a solenoid. And there is no battery whatsoever. It's a closed circuit. Ok, those wires here are closing the circuit. And let's see what else. The more the turn is the circuit, the more sensitive the device becomes, okay? The circuit becomes. And now what he's going to do? Remember, there's no battery. He's connecting this lamp to this coil, but because there is no battery whatsoever, the lamp doesn't turn on, right? And he's closing the circuit right now. And let's see what happened. Oh, see? This is a magnet. Okay. He is inducing. An electric, uh, an electric field on this wire. Okay. So, 
when the magnet moves, and uh, uh, when the magnet moves, we have an electric current induced induced in the in the in the solenoid that powers the lamp. Okay, let's take a look at another one here. Experiment. Let's see here. Uh, okay, this other one here. I like this one. Why is fluorescence of sodium responsible for 75% of the population? Electromagnetic induction. Same thing that we had before. And here's a magnet. Okay. Here's the solenoid magnet. And what we have here is an amperimeter. When it inserts the magnet here, you see that the amperimeter detects a current, okay? If the magnet is at rest, there is no change in the magnetic field and no current flows. While the magnet is moving, there is a change in, or in, there are changing magnetic field and a current is induced. This was something that was discovered in the 1800s, which was a huge, just huge when they discovered that. Here's my ammeter, right? My digital ammeter. Here's another loop, another solenoid, several loops. He's changing the polarity. When he changes the polarity, the direction of change of the current is, is opposite as well. And then he goes that. Okay, that's... Uh... Okay, so what we have here... We have two coils. Okay, the, the, what's happening here is the following. Okay, so it's a little bit more complicated, this one here. Note C, let's go from, from let's move backwards a little bit more. I'm gonna explain to you what's exactly happening here. Here, we have this circuit, this closed loop, the solenoid has no battery whatsoever, okay? A solenoid is no battery connected directly to my ammeter. And we have what we have here, we have another solenoid, but this solenoid is connected to a battery. What we have right here is a switch. At this very moment, the switch is open. So no current is passing through the solenoid. Okay. So what he's going to do, this is just another way of inducing an electric current or an electric field in this other circuit. The moment you turn on the switch, there is a buildup of current from zero to a given value in a small interval of time. And because, of, and because there is a buildup of current, there's also a buildup of magnetic field that goes from zero to a given value, right? Which is proportional to the value of the current in this, in this loop. And in this small interval of changing magnetic field, this solenoid induces a current in the other solenoid. That's how this story goes, okay? So let's take a look. No current, okay? Current, a momentary current flows through the outside outer solenoid, and there is a, an induced current in the inner solenoid. See that? And that was this multimeter is displaying. Okay, he closed the switch is open. He's gonna close the switch. Okay, and momentarily we have that spike in the in the current that induces a, a current in the other circuit. That's what the electromagnetic induction is all about. 
So we go going back to my notes. Oh, okay, so let's go look at this one here. Right, close circuit here, solenoid. No battery whatsoever. I put an amperimeter in there, just like they show. I I showed you in the in the in the YouTube videos. And now I approach a magnet bar, magnetic bar, to this closed circuit. Introduce and withdraw. Introduce, withdraw. Okay. If I move it back and forth, a current is going to be induced in this. And perimeter. While the magnet is at rest, there is no current whatsoever. I move the magnet back and forth, and then we have this induced current. Okay, an induced current that's produced by an induced electric field. Okay, so the electric induced electric field is the one that powers the current right here. Another way. Okay, this one here, an illustration of that last uh, video that you saw on YouTube. Okay, here is the switch. Here is the battery. Uh, I you you can see here having a, a a solenoid here that I didn't draw. Okay, the moment I close the switch, there is a buildup of current in this circuit, a current that goes in this direction. The current associated with the current is a magnetic field that also changes in time. And the magnetic field that changes in time induces a current in this other circuit that does not have any battery. Okay. So keep that in mind. That's what this law is all about. And another way of doing that is by changing the area of the closed loop circuit subject to a constant magnetic field, okay? Four different ways, okay? Moving a magnetic bar, turning on and off an electric circuit that's going to produce a change in magnetic field. You can change the area of the loop that has no, no battery whatsoever. Let's see if I have an illustration here for you. Motional EMF, we call it. Ah, okay, here you go. This one here is the case of uh, the loop that's subject to a magnetic field, and we put the loop to rotate. Okay? That's another way. That's another way of doing that. Let me see if I have the motion. I can, unfortunately, I do not have the motional electro, uh, electromagnetic induction here. Oh, here you go. That's the one. Think uh, four different ways, okay? Four different ways. And I'm going to write in a very short way. Four different ways of uh, inducing a current or electric field in a closed loop circuit having no battery one by changing the B field intensity by approaching uh, field intensity by approaching and receding a magnetic bar, a magnet, right? Turning on and off an electric circuit near by a loop, a conducting loop with no battery, okay? Changing the area of a circuit subjected to a magnetic field, to a B field, and the B field can be constant, 
which may be constant. Rotating the rotating a circuit, okay, submerged into a B field. This is the principle of the, this is the principle of the generator for different ways. And then all those four different ways we are going to we're going to put it into a single equation. Okay. All these four ways are going to write down in a single equation. And peers and that that was what we call that uh, you know all these four different uh, ways of inducing a current slash electric field in a circuit, comma, can be su summarized in a single equation. The equation that we call the Faraday's law, the Faraday's law equation. Eleven thirty four. Think about that. Okay. Oh, let's go back here to the this one here, right? Now, think in terms of a real, real way, okay? Two metal conductors parallel to each other. We put a bar, right? That's gonna slide along uh, those two parallel tracks. And then at one end, we connect the resistor, it can be a light bulb, any resistor whatsoever. This railway, this bar we put to move and not only put it to move, but we subject it also to a magnetic field, okay? Once you change the area of the circuit, you also induces a current, you also induce a current in the circuit. Okay, here you go, induce current. You are changing the area of the circuit and you are inducing a current. That, uh, okay, so we go bar approaching and receding, inducing a current. You know, area of the circuit subjected to a magnetic field induces a current as well. And you can put uh, a a loop, right, subject to a magnetic field that changes in time, and you, you can also, you know, rotate the loop right in here that's subject to a magnetic field, four different ways. But what, what's the equation? What's the equation for that, right? Okay, in order to... In order to summarize this law into a single equation, we must recall the definition of magnetic flux. Remember the electric flux? Okay. By the same token that we have an electric flux, we can also have a magnetic flux. The equation of the magnetic flux is something like that. The magnetic field that's parallel to the vector area of the circuit is the, the product of those two, right? It's going to be the flux through the circuit. Okay, 
that would be B cosine of theta A, where theta is the angle between the area vector and the magnetic field. Going back to my illustration, right? One of my first illustrations that you saw. Here you go. Here's the area vector. The area vector is always perpendicular to the plane of the circuit. If the area vector is parallel to the magnetic field, the magnetic flux through the circuit is maximum. Okay? Here you go. If uh, the area vector is parallel to the B field, comma, the magnetic flux is going to be maximum. It's still not the, this is still not the electromagnetic induction law, okay? This is not the electromagnetic induction law yet. This is not the electromagnetic induction law yet. Yet, the electromagnetic in this law uses the above relation. Okay. What the electromagnetic induction law states is that if, okay, if the change in the magnetic flux, not just the change in magnetic field, but the change in magnetic flux, is different of zero, then you induce a current. Then you will induce a current in a circuit. Okay, that was the Faraday law. This is Faraday's law. This is Faraday's law. Let's keep on working on that. This is just a qualitative. This is just a qualitative. Uh, this is just a qualitative formulation. Formulation of Faraday's law. But just, but just a qualitative formulation, not formation, right? Formulation. Of Faraday's law. How else? How else can we can we? Okay, a more generic formulation of Faraday's law and more precise formulation of Faraday's law is this one right in here. The induced voltage in the circuit, the induced electromotive force in the circuit is equal to the change in the magnetic flux with a negative sign, okay? Using Ohm's law, we can rewrite the both. Using Ohm's law, yeah, put, the, put a resistor in your closed circuit and apply Ohm's law, the above equation can be written as okay. Here you go. Like that. Electric potential difference is resistance times induced current, okay? So we have an induced electromotive force, we have an induced current that's associated with the electromotive force. Okay? So the change in electric flux, here you go. The change in electric flux can be achieved in the four different ways we described below. Four different ways we described above, right? One, by changing the B field. Two,
by changing the area of the circuit of the circuit by changing the orientation of the area of the circuit. So the four ways that I described above is in reality three different ways, right? The first two ways that I described was exactly this one. Remember, going back here, by changing the B field intensity, by turning on and off an electric circuit nearby conducting loop is no batteries. When I do that, I'm changing the magnetic field. So it's not four different ways, but three different ways, because those two are exactly the same, the same thing. So three different ways, by changing the orientation of the area of the circuit, okay? And let me show you, I'm gonna, yeah. Those are the ideas that you have to keep in mind to understand electromagnetic induction, okay? And that, do you remember that simulation that you saw of the electric motor, right? That is this nice uh, website with all sorts of different simulations, physical simulation. Okay, we saw the electric motor this one right here, that's what we saw before. Okay, so here you go. An electric current produces mechanical force. Okay, electric current pr produces a mechanical force. Why, why, am I, why am I saying that? There's a reason why I'm saying that, okay? And I'm going to write that down here in my notes. Recall the principle of the rotating loop with a current, right? They call the principle of uh, of the ele okay. I'm gonna put it in this way of the electric. They call. The principle of the electric motor.